Well, before we begin our look at Daniel 11, part 2, as we ramp it up, please join me in prayer. Father, we, we thank you uh, for your word. It is how you have revealed yourself to us. It's how you speak to us. It's how you've spoken to us. And we thank you for that. And we ask that you would give us wisdom and understanding of your word that every day that we would grow in the grace and knowledge of your word and of Jesus Christ. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would illuminate your word for us today, that you would use your word to strengthen us, to sharpen us, to encourage us, to give us hope. Father, bless this time together with you and with each other in your word, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Daniel 11, part to, to still speaking of the vision that Daniel had that's being explained to him by the angel Gabriel. Still in that. And that is going to be what takes up the rest of this entire chapter as well. So let's just jump right back in as we're talking about the interpretation of the vision that Daniel had. We started, uh, we left off in verse 21. So we'll pick up in verse 22. This is uh, going to be talking about a vile person who is not going to be able to do exactly what he wants to do. Verse 22, Armies shall be utterly swept away before him and broken, even the prince of the covenant. And from that time that an, an alliance is made with him, he shall act deceitfully, and he shall become strong with a small people. Without warning, he shall come into the richest parts of the province, he shall do what neither his fathers nor his father's fathers has done, scattering among them plunder, spoil, and goods. He shall devise plans against strongholds, but only for a time. And he shall stir up his power and his heart against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall wage war with an exceedingly great and mighty army, but he shall not stand. For plots shall be devised against him. Even those who eat his food shall break him. His army shall be swept away, and many shall fall down slain. And as for the two kings, their hearts shall be bent on doing evil. They shall speak lies at the same table, but to no avail. For the end is yet to be at the time appointed. What? <laughs> Let's just chunk that out a little bit there, shall we? He, this is going to, he acts deceitfully. The angel's telling Daniel that this new king of the north, the vile person mentioned earlier in verse 21 that we wrapped up with last week, is going to attempt a deceitful covenant with the king of the south. Not only that, he tells him that it will fail. The, Daniel 11 is really, what, this vision, this prophecy is one of the greatest prophecies in all of scripture. And it's one that's been, that has been lived out in, in much of it so that we're able to look at it and see just how perfectly God's prophetic word is. When God says something's going to happen, it's going to happen 100% of the time. So the angel here, Gabriel, is telling Daniel that the new king of the north, that vile person, is going to attempt a covenant of deceit with the king of the south. But it's going to fail. And there's going to be a great battle. And even though this is a great battle with a great number of people, it's not going to change the balance of power at all. Sometimes that happens with battles. You can have a battle between two great armies, and they have this battle, and at the end, it doesn't really go anywhere. Everything kind of stays exactly the same. It makes me think of World War I and the trench warfare, where they would fight for weeks and months for one inch of ground. All this that we just talked about there is fulfilled when Antiochus Epiphanes, remember the vile man, carried on the feud between the dynasties of the king of the north and the king of the south, but pretended friendship at first. Remember, we talked about this great guy, right? He, he didn't come to power through uh, military force. He came to power through machinations, backdoor dealings, flattery. So it shouldn't surprise us that here Antiochus is carrying on this feud, but not necessarily directly at first, indirectly. That's his preferred method, is indirectly. Pretending friendship and alliance in order to catch them off guard and then swoop in. And despite all these massive efforts and despite this massive battle, Antiochus did not stand and his army was swept away. 
The defeat of Antiochus at his second campaign against the king of the south in Egypt was important. It's important because at this point, Egypt beats Antiochus with the help of Rome. That's interesting because at the end of it all, Antiochus and his entire kingdom would be under the dominion of Rome. After all that, he's going to end up being underneath the dominion of Rome. There was a famous battle in which the Roman navy defeated the navy of Antiochus as well. And after that battle, after that sea battle, a Roman general drew a circle around Antiochus in the dirt. And he demanded that he would, to know if he would surrender and pay tribute to Rome before he stepped out of the circle. In other words, this general knew that Antiochus was a man of, of many words with little value to them. So until you step out of the circle that I've drawn drawn on the ground, I want you to commit to sending tribute to Rome, that you're going to surrender and send Rome tribute, that you're going to tuck your tail between your legs, be a good boy, and bow down to Rome. And do this and acknowledge that before you step out of the circle. He had to. He had to yield to Rome. He had no choice. And from that point on, there was no doubt that Antiochus took his orders from Rome and was under the Roman dominion. Oh, how the mighty had fallen. Even those who eat of his table and of his delicacies shall destroy him. This was fulfilled in the treachery against Antiochus IV by his very own counselors. It's funny how, you know, if you're a man with no scruples and no morality and no honor and no virtue... You shouldn't expect the loyalty of anyone of virtue either. And this was shown when his very own counselors turned on him. Verse 28. After all this, it's all in concrete sequential order, right? Verse 28. And he shall return to his land with great wealth, but his heart shall be set against the holy covenant. And he shall work his will and return to his own land. At the time appointed, he shall return and come into the south, but it shall not be this time as it was before. For ships of Kittim shall come against him, and he shall be afraid and withdraw, and shall turn back and be enraged and take action against the Holy Covenant. And he shall turn back and pay attention to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. What is this saying here? Well, in verse 30, when it talks about ships of Kittim, a Roman fleet from Cyprus sides with Egypt and thwarts Antiochus's attack. He backs down because he doesn't want to enrage Rome. And so he leaves Egypt. Just couldn't leave well enough alone. Had to go south and attack one more time in hopes of glory and fortune and wealth. But Antiochus's plan is blown up When these ships from a Roman fleet from Cyprus sides with Egypt and comes to their aid, well, he doesn't want to enrage all of Rome by attacking Roman vessels. So he leaves Egypt. His plan fails. But he is angry. He is upset. And he is going to take out his rage on the way back on the Israelites. He opposed God's covenant that some Jews kept, the Mosaic covenant. Antiochus showed favors to Jewish apostates, those who would leave the faith, those who forsake the covenant of God. He would show, he would show favor to them in a way of encouraging that to keep happening. Let's keep writing or reading. Verse 31. Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress. Remember what I just said? That Antiochus didn't get his way going down to Egypt, has to turn around and go back home. He's mad. So he's going to take it out on the Israelites. And here we read of that. Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offering. And they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. He shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant. But the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. And the wise among the people shall make many understand. 
Though for some days they shall stumble by sword and flame, by captivity and plunder. In other words, those who believe and know the truth will instruct others in what the scriptures say and will suffer persecution. Verse 34, when they stumble, they shall receive a little help and many shall join themselves to them with flattery. In other words, many are going to fall away. When Antiochus does this, the result is going to be that some will stay true and some will be taught by those who believe the truth and will instruct others in scripture. They will be persecuted, but there will also be those who choose to fall away from the faith. And those who are committed to keeping the covenant are going to have very little help, humanly speaking. Some fearing the faithful remembrance dealings with the apostates would pretend loyalty. So there's two groups. There's a group that stay true to God and to his scriptures, a small remnant who face great oppression and persecution as this is happening. And then there's a group who fell away, who never really were, were saved or true in the first place. They fell away siding with Antiochus and with human safety. Verse 35, And some of the wise shall stumble so that they may be refined, purified, and made white until the time of the end, for it still awaits the appointed time. So this vile person, Antiochus IV, returns to his land, and he's going to attack the land, the people, the temple of Israel. It'll be a time of great treachery and great Courage. Both things are happening at the exact same time. So he shall do damage and return to his own land. Again, bitter with defeat, he returns to his own land after not being able to conquer Egypt yet again. He vents his anger against Jerusalem. Jerusalem is already shaken, you understand, because Antiochus had already sold the office of the high priest. He had bought it and sold it. He already persecuted the Jewish people to conform to Greek culture, forsaking the faith and traditions of their forefathers. This had already been happening. He's just turning up the heat even more. When he failed in his invasion of Egypt, Antiochus Epiphanes returned home with only great plunder. He had stolen some plunder, so he had great wealth. That's what it means while returning with his land to his land with great riches. They shall take away, he shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation or the abomination that will make things desolate. What does that mean? That was when Antiochus Epiphanes set up an image of Zeus at the Jerusalem temple altar. We've talked before about how prophecy can have a near fulfillment and it can have a far fulfillment, right? We see the near fulfillment of this prophecy when Antiochus sets up the image of Zeus at the temple altar. There will be a future fulfillment that has not yet come to pass when the Antichrist, the final Antichrist, comes and will want worship and demand worship in God's temple. The final desolation of, or final abomination of desolation. In this case, Antiochus is demanding sacrifice to this image of Zeus. And he would sacrifice a pig on it. This is abominable. This would have ruined the, cleanse, the cleansing and the purity of the temple. And now no one would come to worship there at all. Because he has desecrated the sanctuary. They had his soldiers, and he would also have those who were apostate from the Jewish people guarding the temple, not allowing any worship of the true kind to happen there. Not, not letting anybody come in or go out that wasn't part of Antiochus's plan. During all this, there was no uh, daily sacrifices, no circumcision. Instead, all that's happening there is desecration in Israel's temple. The Jews were the ones who called it the abomination of desolation or the emptying, emptying or ruining of worship. The Antiochus soldiers would, would spew uh, pig broth all over the altar and all over the temple because they knew that that was offensive to the Jews and to their worship. 
It is both Daniel and Jesus who talk about this atrocity and that this is a preview in this context of what will happen later under the final Antichrist. Those who do wickedly against the covenant shall corrupt with flattery, but the people who know their God shall be strong. What that's saying there is that when Antiochus turned on Jerusalem, the Jewish people were divided. Like I said earlier, two groups of people. Some some sticked or stuck with what God's word said and stayed faithful, and others did not. Others stick, stuck with God, others went with Antiochus and went with the crowd, forsaking their covenant with God and embracing Greek culture instead. But those who knew their God made a stand for righteousness in the face of persecution. And those Jews who were loyal to God, they stood on firm convictions. Rather than compromise, they chose death or suffering or persecution. Eventually, they would be led in a successful revolt by Judas Maccabeus, and he was helped with the Romans as well. Scripture says, For many days they shall fall by sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. This is talking about the attack on Jerusalem. Antiochus is said to have killed over 80,000 Jews, taken 40,000 as prisoners, and sold another 40,000 as slaves. Imagine during all that time facing that kind of persecution, staying faithful, having the kind of fortitude and insight to know that it is better to stay faithful to God and have all of eternity than it is to give up your faith for a sense of temporary security. These true believers at that time were to fall as martyrs. And the gracious design of such suffering was to sanctify them The pattern of persecution continues until the end time that God has appointed at Christ's second coming. This continues on until that time. End time prepares us for the transition. Anytime you see end times, it's talking about the time in between Christ's ascension to heaven and his return. And this is talking not only about Antiochus, but about the, who, who is a foreshadowing of Antichrist, but talking about the Antichrist who in the end time will be in power. The willful king, the little horn. Scripture again says, until the time of the end, because it is still for an appointed time. That is actually, as confusing as that verse might be to you, what it's really saying is that this terror can only last as long as God allows it. And that is comforting. The same goes for any hardship that you go through. It can only last as long as God allows it. For as long as God has appointed it. And that, again, is comforting. And it is also comforting to know that God has a purpose even for suffering and persecution. Verse 36 in Daniel 11. Now there's a shift, a major shift. That was kind of, verse 35 kind of points us into a shift in the viewpoint here. This is now going to be a shift to future fulfillment. It's all been talking about near and far prophecy, but now it's going to be leveled more towards future. Summarizing Daniel's 70th week, This is a transition point to the end times Antichrist. Verse 36, And the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished. For what is decreed shall be done. You notice how that is, a, that is a major shift, right? It's not just talking near and far. Now it was a major shift to far fulfillment. 
This is talking about the final Antichrist in the last seven years before Christ's millennial kingdom. This, this one that's being talked about here is the final Antichrist. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god. The angel is telling Daniel here that this king is going to blaspheme God like never seen before. And he's going to exalt himself like it has never been seen before. And this is all going to happen until the wrath that God has appointed has been accomplished. And that everything God has said is going to be done will be done. He shall prosper, that's talking about the Antichrist, till the indignation is complete, till, till God's punishment on his people is complete and accomplished. For what is decreed by God shall be done. He's going to blaspheme God, and he's going to place himself above every God. This is that final world dictator. He's not just a ruler of the world, he's a, he's, he's a God. And he's above every other God. No one else will be worthy of worship in his mind but him. Daniel is told that this revelation per pertains to the latter days. He was told that back in Daniel 10, verse 14. And here in Daniel 11, verse 36, we begin to look towards that final world dictator. We know that everything about this prophecy is not fulfilled during Antiochus' rule and reign. We also know that Jesus specifically said, and don't forget, Jesus came after Antiochus, okay? Jesus specifically said, in Matthew 24, that the real abomination of desolation was still in the future. In Matthew 24, when Jesus is talking about the desolation or the abomination of desolation, he's speaking about it having still not happened. He's talking at that point about the Antichrist, about what is still yet to come. And we know that because the context of Matthew 24 is his apostles asking him, Tell us the, the signs of what is to come. Tell us about the future and the end of the age and your return, right? When you will reign, tell us about that. And that's how, one of the ways that Jesus answers that question, that there will be an abomination of desolation, speaking to the future. The Apostle Paul paraphrased Daniel 11.36 in reference to the coming Antichrist. He does this in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4. He says this, Again, he's referencing the coming Antichrist. Again, Paul lived after Antiochus IV. Okay? Paul says this, 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 through 4. Let no one be deceived and deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Any guess who that is? That is the Antichrist. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That hasn't happened yet. That's future. That's future. Antiochus Epiphanes IV, he, he is important, but he is only important in historical context, a preview of the Antichrist that is to come. This is why so much attention is given to him here in Scripture, because he, he, preview, he previews or prefigures the ultimate evil man. He's an evil man, don't get me wrong. Antiochus Epiphanes is no saint by any stretch. He is an evil man considers himself deity, bad dude. But as awful and bad and evil as he is, the Antichrist is the ultimate of that. Far, far worse. You could kind of think of Antiochus as a trailer for the movie The Antichrist. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god. Antiochus did this in the general sense that all sinners oppose God. But you notice he put up a statue to Zeus, sacrificed to Zeus. That's still Greek culture. He was still 
somewhat loyal to Greek religious traditions. He didn't put up a statue of himself. The Antichrist is going to put up a statue of himself. He's going to worship himself. He was just trying, Antiochus was just trying to get the Jews to go along with Greek culture. The Antichrist is going to flip all that upside down and say, no, you're worshiping the wrong God. I am God. Far, far worse. All this is going to be fulfilled fully in the Antichrist who will sit as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Of course, we know the truth. He is not God. There's only one God and he is on the throne and has always been on the throne and will never be taken off the throne. God will allow the Antichrist to do much damage, but he is on a short chain. He can only do what God allows him to do. Some God, right? Antichrist thinks he's, he's going to think he's a God. Some God, when you're on a short chain of only being allowed to do what God allows you to do. Yet he will do much damage. And all that damage that he does is going to work perfectly into God's plan. Work perfectly into God's plan in such a way that everything the Antichrist does will ultimately be accomplishing God's purpose to which he set it to. That's how great our God is. Verse 37 in Daniel 11. This is going to talk about the character of the Antichrist, right? He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other god, for he shall magnify himself above all. See how clearly this is talking about somebody else now? You notice the tone change? Remember when I said that here's where it shifts. After verse 35, it makes a, a, a big shift to talking about the Antichrist. Before it was talking about Antiochus, it was near prophecy and far prophecy talking about the Antichrist. And then after verse 35, it's a major shift to where it's all focused on the Antichrist. He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. He shall pay not attention to any other god, for he shall magnify himself above all. He shall honor the god of fortresses instead of these, a god whom his fathers did not know. He shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He shall deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign god. Those who acknowledge him he shall load with honor. He shall make them rulers over many and shall divide the land for a price. Pagan Gentiles have traditional gods that are passed down from their fathers. Cultural gods, so to speak. But this king has no regard for any of them. The Antichrist has no regard for any of them. They mean nothing to him. His only God is power. That is the God of fortresses. That's what that means. When you see God of fortresses, what does that mean? It means that his only God is power. That's all he cares about is power. Talks about desiring women, the God of women. Don't just read over that. This could mean several things. It, it, it certainly means that he surely has no interest in women. He has no desire for women. He has no interest in women. It, does, it is not something that grabs his attention at all. That could or could not mean that he's also homosexual. We don't know. But it certainly means that he has no interest in women. So the Antichrist, if you're talking about characteristics of the Antichrist, he has no regard for any god or any culture's god, be it the true god or a pagan god. He has no care for that. He only cares and has regard for power. And he will not be uh, a man who is interested in women. Women will not be something that can grab his attention or take his focus off of what his true goal is, which is power. When it says he shall honor a god of fortresses, it's just saying that he shall take and hold power with might. Remember how Antiochus, he didn't take and hold power with might. He was flattery, deception, all this stuff, right? The Antichrist is going to be shrewd, all right. And he will certainly use every tool in the toolbox to get his way. 
but he will also be able to take and hold power with military might. That's what it means by he shall honor a God of fortresses. And he will have great riches and he will use those great riches shrewdly, wisely, from a worldly perspective. And people who honor him, he will honor, right? Do, do my bidding, refer to me as a God amongst men, and I will give you this great city or this great promotion or this great place in my court. Verse 40. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. But the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and with many ships. And he shall come into countries and shall overflow and pass through. This is the, the final conflict of south and north. The south was Egypt in our earlier context. Here is the last great battle with the final army from the north retaliating against an attack of the final so southern power. This is still, we haven't changed context, it's still talking about Antichrist. The Antichrist will not allow this. Anybody who stands up to him, you get a couple, you get a couple kings or a couple uh, large groups of people who have a little bit of military power and they decide they're going to stand up to the Antichrist. He's not going to allow that without striking back hard and defeating them. And that is exactly what is said is going to happen. The Antichrist will withstand an onslaught and he will prevail and he will enter Israel, referred to as the beautiful land, and perhaps it will be at that time that he will commit the abomination of desolation. And at that time, he will be established in power for a time. That's going to be when he's at his zenith, at the, at the peak of his power. Verse 41, he shall come into the glorious land. That's Israel. So don't forget, we're reading in concrete sequential order, right? So if we go back to verse 40, at the time of the end, end times, right? And that can, that can mean any time between Christ's ascension and his return. And this is talking about the end of that time. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, meaning the Antichrist. The king of the south shall attack the Antichrist. But the king of the north, who is the Antichrist, shall rush upon him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and with many ships. And he shall come into countries and shall overflow and pass through. Verse 41, he shall come into the glorious land, that's Israel, and tens of thousands shall fall, but these shall be delivered out of his hand, Edom and Moab, and the main part of the Ammonites. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall become ruler of the treasures of gold and of silver, and all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Cushites shall follow in his train. But news from the east and the north shall alarm him, and he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction." And he shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. The angel here is describing to Daniel a confederation of kings that are going to come against this great leader, the Antichrist. And with a battle in and near the holy land, the beautiful land. The king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. Hard to know who that is specifically referring to. If you say, which countries is that referring to? It's hard to know. Because that landscape changes, doesn't it, over time? The precise points might be cloudy, but the general idea is clear that the end will be marked by a great conflict that's going to culminate in the world's armies gathering in the promised land to do battle. And yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. That's the long and short of it. You want to know what the future of the Antichrist is? There is no hope for him or for any of his followers. No one is able to help him against God, who by the return of Christ brings him to his end. We'll talk more of this as it continues on to Daniel 12 next time. Please join me in prayer.
Father, it is good to know that all evil does not stand a chance against you. That even the Antichrist has no hope of standing against you or those who will follow him have no hope of standing against you. No one can help anyone against God. What a fearful thing it is to fall into your hands if we are not saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Oh, how we look forward to the return of Christ who will bring down all evil and make all things right and new. We look forward to that. Help us to put our faith and trust in you and in your faithfulness and in your power, O ancient of days, so that no matter what's going on all around us, the world is topsy-turvy, that we would be steady, calm, and secure in the knowledge of who our God is and how faithful and perfect and powerful you are, that everything is going according to your plan and no one else's. And help us to rest in that plan. In Jesus' name, amen.